very last session of the Bhagavad Gita. We are at chapter 18 and we'll continue with verse 67. After the next few verses, we will do a kind of a summarization or an overview of the entire scripture. And if you have any questions regarding the Bhagavad Gita from any any chapter for that matter, we can have a more general discussion as well. I will start with verse 67 to verses 67 to 71. This should never be taught by you to a non-ascetic or a non-devotee, nor to someone inattentive, nor to one who defames me. He who narrates the supreme secret to my devotees, completing his highest devotion toward me, will come to me alone, without doubt. Among human beings, there is no one who causes me greater pleasure, nor shall there be anyone more beloved of me on earth than one who will read this virtuous dialogue that has occurred between us. Let him sacrifice unto me with the sacrificial observance of knowledge. This is my view. Endowed with faith and without calumny, whichever human should hear this, even he liberated would obtain the beautiful words of those with meritorious acts. The very first verse says this should not be taught to one who is non-ascetic or non-devotee. Why should it not be taught? And what is meant by a non-ascetic or non-devotee? Why should it not be taught to someone who is inattentive? Someone who defames me. Often it has been said <clears throat> by Sri Krishna that these are the secret teachings. What was the secret? We have gone through the entire text. What was secret about this? The words have been spoken, a lot has been said. We found out, we discovered that the, the divinity is within us. Is that the secret? There is a misunderstanding among a lot of seekers and those who start out on this path of spirituality, that there is some grand secret which is being kept from you. And that if you should only know this secret, then suddenly all problems will disappear. The reality is that everything has already been said in this text. There is nothing new to learn. There is nothing exciting, new, creative, different. It's the same teachings. If you hear it today in a different form from a modern teacher who is authentic, maybe he says or she says this in a different way. You can say it's like old wine in new bottles. It's been repackaged. But the teachings are the same. It certainly does happen that some people try to put new wine in old bottles in the sense that they make up their own concepts or ideas and then they try to sell this as the authentic traditional yoga. 
we are not talking about those kind of people. We are talking about the authentic teachings. There is no secret. It's all here. But still, the scriptures say, do not teach, do not teach to a non-ascetic or non-devotee. So what is it that they mean? What should not be taught? The reality is that most seekers are not ready for certain steps or certain stages of development. If you take a child who is in class one and we tell him or try to explain to him the mathematics or the history which is from class 10, obviously the child from class 1 cannot possibly understand this. Why is that? Because the child has not gone through the process of step by step acquiring certain skills and learning certain things in a systematic manner. So also here, that which is being taught in the scripture, what has been said, may be understood at an intellectual level, but it is not really understood from the point of direct experience. There was a point when Arjun said, I have, I have understood all this, what you have told me, but I have no direct experience. Can you show me your universal form? Can you give me that glimpse of that universal form? And Sri Krishna, through his grace, gives him that glimpse. That is his Vishwarup, the Vishwarup Darshan that short glimpse of his cosmic form is that direct experience. And once you have this direct experience, your understanding is completely different. It's no longer intellectual. What this verse means is, do not Teach these things to somebody who is not really ready to understand such teachings. Can we try to force these ideas upon someone who is completely materialistic, completely disinterested in deeper matters? It does not work. There are a lot of people in the world who are suffering. And some of you may have friends or relatives who are suffering like this and you think, oh, let me help this person. And you, out of your goodness of your heart, say, oh, you should practice this. You should come to my teacher. You should learn meditation. What happens? The person is not interested. And you find out that they are polite and they say yes, yes, but they're not really interested. Some people even get very aggressive. If you try to forcefully teach something, most people are not ready to transform their lives. They may be ready to read a book, but they are not ready to integrate these teachings in their life. And that's why we see there are people who are willing to come at an intellectual level and listen and, and discuss. But when you tell them you need to transform your own behavioral habit patterns, this makes them very angry. And then they go away because they are not really ready to change from within.
at each step in a very systematic way, if you learn meditation, the teacher will guide you step by step according to your level of development. If you are not ready for something, but you keep wanting to jump ahead and to go beyond your level, what will happen? The result will be disastrous. It is exactly as I said, you're trying to take a child from class 1 and put him into class 10 or class 7 or 8 or 9. It does not work. A child is going to be completely overwhelmed. And this is exactly what happens when the mind of a certain student is not mature, is not ready. And it wants to, it, it, you're too ambitious, over ambitious, and you try to do more than your capacity. This is not useful. This can be harmful to you in many ways. So one who is not attentive will in any case not follow or not grasp these kind of subtleties. The one who is not ascetic should also not learn this. What does this mean by ascetic here? Does that mean that we all need to become renunciates, not um, enjoy our life, not, not lead the lives of householders? That's not what it means. We should not be taught to anyone having excessive attachment to worldly objects and worldly life because such a person is not ready. A non-devotee is somebody who does not value these things, who is not looking for something deeper. In this way we say that these teachings are not suitable for those who are not a little bit, have not learned a bit of detachment. So a little bit of Vairagya, a little bit of Thyaga should be there. Otherwise, the student is not ready. The student is not worthy of these teachings. In a systematic manner, if you start meditation, you will learn this process over a period of time through a teacher who will guide you step by step. It is said through modern studies done in the fields of psychology and other scientific areas, studying excellence in any field to achieve excellence, a state of achievement, requires around 10,000 hours of practice. These studies were done by psychologists in the field of athletics, piano, chess, violin. In these areas, they found that to become an expert, to master that activity, one needs 10,000 hours. The same can be said for spiritual attainment. To acquire spiritual attainment, you need approximately 10,000 hours of practice sadhana meditation. There are a lot of people who have been doing some form of practice and they say, 
I have been doing this for 30 years. 30 years sounds like a long time. On prodding a little bit deeper, asking, so how much do you practice daily? We find out that, in fact, the person has not been practicing daily. In fact, it might be very sporadic. And so, these ideas that people say, oh, I have been practicing meditation since five years. I have been doing this since 10 years, 20 years. This has very little meaning. If you are genuinely interested, you can do a rough calculation of how much time you really spend in doing some form of practice. Even if it is only some sort of asana practice, you know, more physical level, still, even if you count that, if you count some time you spend with the pranayam, count some time you spend in prayer, in meditation, and come up with a calculation, you will see that it's probably not enough. It's probably not enough to attain some sort of mastery in this field. If you calculate this, 10,000 hours is a long time. If you do only one hour of practice a day, you need 27 years. You need 27 years to attain some mastery in spirituality. If you are willing to devote two years of your, two, sorry, two hours of your day to sadhana, it will take you 13 and a half years. See, the calculation is interesting because it makes you realize that you need to put effort. Nothing is going to come out of nothing. Some amount of effort is required and you need to be realistic about the time you have and the time you're willing to spend. How important is this for you? Is this a priority in your life? The moment it starts becoming a priority, you will spend more time seeking out an authentic teacher and doing sincere practice. If you spend three hours a day, now it is getting serious. If you need three hours a day, you will need nine years to attain something. If you get even a few little glimpses, you begin to grasp something, you, your longing is increasing, you're willing to spend even four hours a day, you will need only six and a half years. I say only six and a half years. Because with this kind of urge, with this kind of longing, determination, it's actually not much time. Most of us who are well educated have spent four to six years trying to get some sort of a degree at university. So if you imagine the effort you put into that, you can put in four hours a day then you need about six to seven years. And I know a lot of people tell me, oh, I have no time, I'm very busy. And I say to these people, you know, there are a lot of busy people in the world. There are those who are running countries and running a multi-million um, dollar um, companies. But... Even these people manage to find time to take care of their own health. An hour a day at least. So, the people who tell me this, I say to them, this means that 
your development, your growth, your attainment of spirituality is not such a priority. It's okay. Maybe it's a phase of your life. But for those who are very serious and are willing to spend five hours a day, they can do this in five and a half years. Only the one with the deepest desire will spend more than five hours a day. If that is a burning desire, like a man who is drowning, is gasping for air, the only thing he wants is air. So, if you have that intensity and you're willing to spend six hours or more, then you can attain that in four or four and a half years. It's not much time if you think about it. Four years of your life one can invest in this. This is far more important than any education. Yet, we find that the determination is missing, the will is missing. There are so many things which come into our lives and be, keeps us busy. So, therefore, one says, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam. Don't impart, don't impart, don't impart. The most secret of teachings is not taught to those who are not ready. So in a tradition such as ours, the student is guided step by step. Taken from one stage to the next with systematic practices. And this is depending on the level of maturity, uh, the level of attainment that the student already has. And you take it from there. In verse 70, it says, the one who will read this virtuous dialogue. This idea of dialogue is very important. Most scriptures in the world, like the Bhagavad Gita, is a dialogue between Arjuna and Krishna. The Upanishads are dialogues between different characters. The Katha Upanishad, for example, is a dialogue between a young boy and the Lord of Death. Tripura Rahasya are also a collection of stories which are dialogues between a wise enlightened princess and her husband where the princess is the teacher the husband is a student or oh, there are many other interesting situations which are created for dialogues the emphasis on dialogue is also very much a part of the teachings we cannot really learn this from books the way we may learn things in school. These are things where you learn for a profession. You want to learn to be a doctor. You want to learn how to be a, a physicist. You want to learn how to be a historian. Many of these things can be done by reading books. But certain things require practical aspect. If you want to learn the piano, it's very difficult to learn it from books. You need a teacher. If you want to learn in athletics, you, want, you, you can't learn athletics, become a great athlete by reading books. You need a practical element in it for which you need a teacher at a practical level. The same is to be understood here. To attain these high states of consciousness requires a teacher 
who will dialogue with you, who will talk to you, who will communicate with you at an individual level. And that is why we have often placed a great deal of emphasis in these meetings. And we have said always, you can listen to these meetings and the discussions on the channel. You can read books, you can look at websites, you can look at videos. But these are not a substitute for a direct dialogue with your teacher. Because that has a power to transform you. Videos, books, all these things cannot. Because a book cannot gently nudge you back onto track when you are going off track. A website cannot scold you and say, Hey, you are, you are going off track. Watch out. This is also a very important part of the guidance, the cautionary notes, the warnings, the, the scoldings. All this cannot be done by passive instruments such as books, websites, videos, etc. These mediums cannot correct your interpretation of scriptures. That is another aspect which is extremely important. So you see, therefore, it is said, do not impart, do not impart, do not impart. It does not mean that this is only given to a few privileged ones. Yes, you can become privileged and worthy if you are willing to put in effort. But if you are not willing to put in effort, if it's you want some instant enlightenment, that's not going to happen. There has to be a commitment. And so the emphasis on not giving this to those who are not worthy. And this is not only written in our tradition of, the, I mean, by our tradition, I mean the Indian traditions. For example, it is also mentioned in the New Testament. So, scriptures from different parts of the world say the same thing. Do not force anybody into this and do not give this to those who are not worthy or not ready. Any questions or comments? Those of you who are doing some practice or some sort of sadhana, maybe you can do a little rough calculation to see how many hours of meditation you have done up to now. It's a, a good exercise to, you know, to, to see where you are and where you have to go. Those of you who have not done much may feel disheartened and... Uh, and you think of 10,000 hours and if you have maybe um, 80 hours or, or 200 hours, then it may seem disheartening. But it is in fact not disheartening. You need to know your journey. If you want to go from um, London to, to Sydney, it's a long way and you need to prepare for that. It's no point saying, oh no, it's not far, it's okay. But that's the reality. It is a very long distance. So this is important to understand 
how you need to prepare yourself. Okay, so I will continue since uh, there are no questions to this or are there? I have not looked in the chat. Sometimes I forget. Ah, yes. Um, oh yeah, the question from Balaji, which I didn't see there. In, does this include time for reading scriptures or only meditation? Well, <clears throat> ideally speaking, this should be the meditation time because that's the time you spend unlearning your old behavioral habit patterns. These are very deep-seated habit patterns. So that's what is... Uh, uh, talked about here. The reading and this kind of things um, are not included because this is a part of the learning process. Yeah. Does it make sense? The unlearning part is working with your unconscious deep-rooted pattern. So that happens basically during meditation. Right? So when you do a calculation of your meditation hours, number of your meditation hours, do not include the time you are using for reading or um, any other learning, even if it is related to this subject. Okay. So I, I see now the name of the person who joined. I didn't see the chat earlier. Sometimes I forget to look at the chat. <laughs> Okay, so where did we stop? Yes. So I will continue with verse 72 and 73. Did you perchance hear this, O son of Pritha, with a one-pointed mind? Did your delusion of ignorance perchance vanish, O Arjuna? Arjuna said, the delusion has vanished by your grace. I have received remembrance, O infallible one. I stand here free of doubts. I shall act according to your word. Very beautiful verses here. Did you, by perchance, hear this with a one-pointed mind? If you would listen with a one-pointed mind, with full attention, the understanding goes much deeper. If you are not attentive, if your heart is not in the matter, then you cannot really integrate knowledge. Think back to the time you were in school, sitting in a class, sometimes maybe in a subject that you found boring and uninteresting. We're not really listening to your teacher. Huh? Some of you were maybe scribbling on in your books, doodling some little drawings, or you were making little rockets to throw at each other the moment the teacher turned her back and was writing something on the board. And you started throwing rockets everywhere, paper planes. Or you were sending, writing little messages to your friend and it was being passed down. <laughs> so <laughs> these are very cute little incidents. I'm sure you all can remember this. It was a complete <laughs> lack of interest or attention in the class because the subject was not interesting or the, or the teacher was not motivating you. But in those subjects where you were interested, or the teacher was really able to motivate you. There you paid full attention. You enjoyed yourself. You participated in the class. You asked questions. 
you were not inattentive you were not thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow and what you're going to do after you get out of here you were just part of the class in that moment and the one pointed mind is a mind without conflicts so it is not merely paying attention in that moment but it's also a mind where there are not so many conflicts at this very moment are you listening with a one pointed mind are you listening or are you thinking what shall i do after the meeting are you listening to this carefully or are you wondering do i really want to know about all this bhagavad gita stuff is this not all old fashioned is this not um, boring or something for you know boring people are there these doubts in your mind a mind which has got doubts cannot integrate this knowledge so he asks were you listening there is a great deal of emphasis on listening in indian tradition we talk about smriti and shruti smriti is remembering and shruti is listening that which is heard why this emphasis on listening most of the time we are reading information or we are talking and listening is one of these cognitive senses which is not active and learning to listen to the external teacher prepares you eventually to listen to the internal wisdom so a great deal of emphasis on listening and integrating this knowledge arjun is a good listener because his life is at stake he is suffering he is miserable he is there in the middle of the battlefield it's a matter of life and death when something is a matter of life and death you pay attention so those of you hopefully none of you but maybe some of you have had some sort of accident or some moment of trauma and you may remember or recall that in that moment of trauma of an accident everything seems to somehow slow down and your perception is heightened it's as if everything is happening in slow motion in reality what is happening is absolute attention everything else recedes from your field of awareness and you are completely one pointed because it's a matter of life and death and that is how it is for arjun he is in the middle of the battlefield there it's a matter of life and death for himself as well as all his beloved friends and relatives of course he is completely one pointed and listening and because he's listening he is able to integrate this knowledge he is understood and the one who has integrated the knowledge he's got the gist of the knowledge cannot forget you cannot forget something like that you always remember we come back to the school example i'm sure you all remember that in history there were a lot of dates and years you know the battle of this took place on this day and the battle of that took place in so and so the freedom movement happened in this year and all these dates nobody remembers but history is not only about dates what you 
will not forget Hagata is the gist of that history. You may remember, you may have forgotten which day India got independence, but you have that gist of that freedom struggle which is in your heart and which is in your mind. Because that was actually the real message. The real message was not how many years it took for India to get freedom, but the real message was what a struggle it was, what great people there were who fought for freedom. And that makes us appreciate that, feel gratitude for that, and value that freedom. So that was the knowledge which we took out of those history classes. Similarly, from these dialogues with Sri Krishna, Arjun has got the juice. He's got the message. He doesn't remember every single word or sentence, but he has got the gist of the knowledge. And that's what is important. And this is why a great deal of emphasis on listening. So if everybody has been listening one-pointedly, they have integrated something, and maybe you have some questions. Okay, good that everybody has been listening very carefully and has integrated this knowledge. <clears throat> okay, then I will continue the very last verses. Sanjay said, now we come back to Sanjay again. <laughs> Sanjay is the narrator. So in case you have forgotten, he is actually the one who is observing the dialogue between Krishna and Arjun. And so we come back to Sanjay at the end, who says, I heard this wondrous dialogue, making my hair stand on end between the indwelling one and the great souled son of Pritha. By the grace of Vyas, I heard the secret most supreme yoga from Krishna, the Lord of Yoga, personally teaching it himself. O King, remembering again and again this wondrous, virtuous dialogue between Krishna and Arjun, I rejoice again and again. And remembering that very wondrous form of the Lord, there is great amazement in me. O oh Lord, and I rejoice again and again. Where there is Krishna, the Lord of Yoga, and where there is the bow bearer, son of Pritha, there glory, victory, success, and polity are definite. This I believe. Anyone who witnesses this beautiful interaction between a student, a genuine, sincere student, and an authentic teacher, will experience this as a very, very powerful moment. It makes your hair stand up. You, you rejoice, it's full of wonder because this is a very privileged moment. It's a very rare gift and only the most privileged ones 
find such a moment with a genuine teacher. That means that the one has worked to make himself worthy of these teachings and is receiving grace. It's a wondrous moment because he saw, he remembered this form of the wondrous form of the Lord. Whenever anybody experiences that, is struck by wonder. You can never forget it. That moment when divinity, the gates of divinity open up and it floods down to you. It's like a shower. There is a tradition. It's called uh, Astak Abhishek. Abhishek means like a shower. It is uh, done for deities, for example. And it's a symbol of the yogic experience. When the Kundalini rises, the prana comes right to the top, the crown of the head, and that's experienced like a shower. It is a shower. It is a pranic shower. This yogic experience is put in a ritual form when deities are given this bath with milk generally and milk is a symbol of love, of wisdom, of knowledge. Mother's milk, you know, is a symbol of nurturing and love. So it's given a bath. The deity is given a bath with milk. And this is also enacted in the Christian ritual, for example, of baptizing. Baptism is also done with, with water. And that water is a symbol of life. And so the shower or wetting the head with water is a symbol of of uh, enlightenment, of, of rebirth. And that's a moment where you rejoice greatly. And being a witness to this moment, Sanjay also rejoices because it was such a unique, such a wonderful moment. Shibu asks, I thought baptism is a kind of diksha. Yes, that is what a diksha really is. Diksha is not merely giving a mantra. That is a lower form of diksha, to get a mantra. The highest form of diksha is remembrance. It is remembering who you are. And that happens when... Kundalini fire awakens, this shower of prana purifies you, you get to know who you are, you remember who you really are. That's an awakening. And awakening is the final diksha. There are different kinds of dikshas, right? The last and the fourth diksha is <clears throat> Sambhavi Diksha, it's also called. A lot of teachers these days make Sambhavi Diksha into some sort of mechanical thing and they give you some mantra or so and they say this is now Sambhavi Diksha. But Sambhavi Diksha is the final Diksha, it is grace. And this is experienced as a tremendous joy These last verses highlight that beautiful relationship between teacher and student. This relationship in these last decades has been trivialized by some. Some people have abused this relationship, misunderstood this relationship. 
So some students think, oh, the teacher is trying to control me. Some think, oh, the teacher wants to, you know, um, brainwash me. There are these ideas about gurus and cults and uh, people have a lot of fear. What they are fearing, of course, is the fact that they will have to change. And the ego does not want that. Ahankara does not like that idea. So that is what one is afraid of. And where there is fear, they cannot be changed. So one has to have some trust. And this relationship is the one that can bring us out of ignorance. That is why always in yoga the parampara is um, emphasized, the, the lineage, the, the relationship with the teacher is emphasized a great deal. And with that, we finish the Bhagavad Gita. After one year and 40 sessions, any questions about these last verses? I would like to summarize the entire Bhagavad Gita or rather give you an overview of this text. We have done this before at different times, but now at the very end, I would like to leave you with these thoughts. Then Arjun came to the battlefield. This battlefield was between good and evil. This is not about mythological characters, real characters. There are many discussions about all this from a meditative perspective. This is a battle in the mind between the forces of ignorance and the forces of light and this is a continuous change that we are going through this is an evolution we are going through all the time at some point of time you you are Arjun you are the seeker you feel you cannot handle this battle anymore these forces of evil seem to have outnumbered the forces of light there are hundred Kaurava brothers fighting against the five Pandavas the symbol of light and wisdom how can you win this battle you are disheartened you are struggling you are unhappy you are miserable Finally, you come to that point where you say, I need a teacher. I need guidance. I need somebody who will show me the way. The mind is so complex. The mind is so tricky. How can I get out of this misery of my own self-created misery? And since you're call for help was sincere, a teacher comes and guides you. A good teacher will first give you an overview. What is this about? And that is chapter 2. That's what Sri Krishna does. He tells him about death. He tells him about life. He says you will die, but your body is only a garment. It's like changing clothes. You will not die. Then he explains to him about lifestyle, about karma, samskaras, how to lead a pure life, how to transform your life in a very simple, practical manner, how to be disciplined, how to be determined. For us, it simply means working with food habits, working with our primitive urges so that there is a certain discipline in our lives. If we lead our lives like animals and allow these animal instincts to take over us, then 
you will sink into that ignorance. You will lead a life of an animal. But if you want to come out of that misery and of those continuous moods and swings and sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're sad, sometimes you're thrilled, sometimes you're in deep despair. To come out of that, you need to have some discipline in your life. So you need to work first with the basic things. When you have acquired a certain amount of disciplined life, learned to understand the relationship between karma and samskaras, then you will watch out what kind of action you perform. You are not going to just do anything and just say, I don't care, I'll just do what I want. You become very aware of the power of your actions and the result it will create for you. And that is what is explained then also in chapters 4 and 5. Now when you have done that, you have organized your life, then you're ready for meditation. If you have not organized your life, you cannot meditate. Those of you who may have tried to do some meditation without organizing your life will realize it's a waste of time. Because all that happens is the disorganized life even disturbs your meditation. What is going to come in your meditation? The same thoughts, the same things which are in your normal life. So if your life is disorganized, if you are just creating havoc, confusion, a lot of emotions, always, you know, a lack of discipline, all these will affect you, will affect your mind. And all this will come forward in meditation. You will not experience anything deeper without certain discipline in daily life. This is explained in chapter 6 and chapter 7 begins to explain self-realization. So what will happen if I continue to meditate? You will begin to understand the self and what self-realization means. Chapter 8 talks about Mantra Yoga. And then when you go deeper into the different layers of the mind, it takes you to the center, to your core. And the amazing thing is, when you come to your center, you discover that there is actually no difference between the internal and external world. The outer world is a reflection of your inner world. Everything you see around you is reflected. Are your own reflection, your own thoughts being reflected around you. And this entire world, all this is a manifestation. When that happens, All these things, you experience Kundalini and then it comes, it brings with it a great devotion, a great love, a great peace, a great joy. And you become a true bhakt. A bhakta, a devotee is not merely a follower, blind faith. It is one who has in fact attained something. Only one who has attained something knows what bhakti is. One who has not attained something is singing songs and, and playing some music, but that is not bhakti. That is music and dance. Bhakti is the nectar within. And experiencing that nectar within is what happens when you have attained something. And the last chapters from 13 right up to 17 go into the analysis of daily life. Everything is a play of gunas. And 
So, in this way, the entire Bhagavad Gita is a summary of the inner journey. It is telling us the story of Arjun, who is none other than you yourself. It could be you and any other genuine seeker. The questions he poses are your questions. So this is what the Bhagavad Gita is. It is a the internal journey and it's explained in this form as a map, a map or a guide for future travelers. Are there any questions regarding this chapter or any other questions regarding the internal journey with reference to the Bhagavad Gita or otherwise? Uh, hello? Yeah, Surabhi, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes, very clear. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Radhika Ji, I want to ask you one question. Mm -hmm. um, what is uh, like the difference between still mind and you know blank mind ah. during meditation? Actually, there is nothing quite like a blank mind. Uh, some people think that in meditation there are no thoughts, and during the earlier stages, the focus is on purification. So. We even say that the thoughts increase. They become so many that there are millions of thoughts at any point of time. And it's like a stream. And suddenly it's like these millions of thoughts have passed down and suddenly the stream runs dry. And you may think there are no thoughts. But what is there then? Pure consciousness. It's not empty. It is full of joy. The still mind is when all this has been coordinated. You know, manas, buddhi, chitta, ankara, they are well coordinated and so there are no conflicts. Such a mind gets karma, one-pointed and when that happens, you can go through to this part of you deeper inside where this experience of pure consciousness brings with it pure absolute joy. So actually there's nothing like a blank mind. Yes, at any point of time there are thoughts and if not consciously, at an unconscious level there is activity. I don't know if that was helpful. Was that useful for you? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. From a practical perspective also, you know, there is nothing like a blank mind. <clears throat> if there, there are some people who say, oh, meditation means a blank mind. Meditation means no thoughts. And I, I can't... And then they try to not think. And the moment they try not to think, then you think even more. <laughs> Because you're trying to not think. So there's, there's nothing like a blank mind. This is um, a deep science actually. What has been studied in the and uh, explained in the Yoga Sutras. Uh, sometime we will also be doing the Yoga Sutras and uh, then we will go through that systematically and hopefully you will get some insights into the different levels in meditation and how one acquires a still mind that is a one-pointed mind, a mind that's fully well-coordinated 
and then goes to that place where is not empty but full full of joy not full of thoughts but full of joy okay any other questions comments The Bhagavad Gita is in fact a summary of all the knowledge from the Upanishads. All these beautiful teachings of the Upanishads are summarized. In fact, some of the verses are almost uh, the same. Most, uh, some of the verses from the Bhagavad Gita are exactly the same, taken from the Vedas or the Upanishads that predate the Bhagavad Gita. And chapter 2 is a summary of the Bhagavad Gita. So you can see that the knowledge is the juice of the, the Upanishads is the Bhagavad Gita and the juice of the Bhagavad Gita is in chapter 2. This is um, a juice of all the knowledge that one should know and eventually integrate into one's life and hopefully also Realize directly, eventually. That is our, that is what we aspire to. It's not a intellectual um, philosophy, but a living philosophy that can transform our lives. Okay, so I hope everybody enjoyed this last year got something out of these sessions all the verses um, sorry all the sessions have been recorded and are on the channel and there will be today's session is the 40th so they will all be there latest by i guess monday or tuesday and so anytime you need to catch up on something you may have missed on you will find those sessions on the channel. Next Friday is a holiday for most people in most parts of the world. So we are taking a break next Friday. The Friday after that is the 21st of April. And we will start on the 21st of April the Mandukya Upanishad. This is a very important Upanishad especially for those who are meditating, who are meditators. And um, it explains the meaning of Om, the three states of consciousness, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and the witness beyond. A very interesting Upanishad, very short, only 12 verses. And um, I'm presuming that these sessions will last for, um, yeah, probably 12 um, Fridays um, probably take um, one verse for every session and go deeper into it. And uh, I hope that uh, you will enjoy that as well. And I hope that all of you have a nice weekend. Since there do not seem to be any more questions or comments, we can end our session here. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye bye. Bye, Shibu. Bye, Survi. Thank you. Bye, Rita. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, thank bye, you. Bye, bye. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. Bye, bye, Mita. Bye, Nicholas. Bye, Matthias. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye, bye, Gautam. Bye, Chandrasekhar. So, Badra, it was good that you joined. I think you have been writing to us and um, that's, that's good that you managed to 